Um, it really is a pleasure to be here and talk about something that's obviously close to my own heart, working in journalism for now 13 years uh, continuously, which is um, actually a great privilege and, and I'm a bit, uh, quite lucky to have been able to uh, remain successfully employed and, and continually employed in that industry that is having, as you all know, some, some difficulties. And, and that's really sort of the, uh, where my, the topic or the, I should say, the, the title of my talk comes from, a vanishing monopoly. Uh, even at some a place like Reuters, which uh, I'm sure all of you at least know the name and have probably read a lot of our coverage, we can't assume that we are in fact anywhere near a monopoly or, or that the media has a monopoly. There are a lot of interesting things going on. And I want to talk to you about all of those because I think that uh, those of you working in the industry and in academia, et cetera, and government uh, can really sort of take advantage of what's happening and maybe uh, slightly to my detriment uh, or to my staff's detriment, but in fact there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, uh, yes, disclosures, I, uh, I suppose it's obvious, but uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to let you know what conflicts of interest I might have. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward that I am a full-time employee of Thomson Reuters. We do all sorts of things. Uh, my particular division obviously does health news, which is pretty relevant to what I'm talking about today. Uh, but we also, of course, own uh, Thomson Scientific, uh, Institute of Scientific Information and all of that. Um, and I will mention some things about impact factor that will probably be relevant there. Uh, and just because sometimes I'm asked to also disclose what my wife does. Uh, she's also a journalist. She works at CNN. Um, we have not exactly diversified, so, you know, one day I uh, may need other kinds of help, uh, but that's another story. Um, some of you may be familiar with this cartoon. It's one of my favorites. Uh, if you can read it up there a little bit, uh, not, you don't need to read the details, but this is this sort of today's me random medical news uh, from the New England Journal of Panic-Inducing Gobbledygook. Um, th there are three, three wheels, and you spin each wheel, and that's the anchor from uh, News 11 or something like that, uh, saying, well, today it's coffee can cause depression in twins. Um, and of course, tomorrow it might be exercise can cause hypothermia in men 25 to 40. Uh, it could be anything. But I think that, you know, this is sort of a good way to set up, you know, what we have to deal with, what you have to deal with as consumers of news. Um, these obviously are uh, really making fun of observational studies. Uh, some of these might be randomized control, although it would be hard to imagine how you would do some of these as uh, randomized control studies. Um, this is sort of my second favorite cartoon. Uh, this comes from something called XKCD, which I would hardly recommend, PhD Comics. Um, I used to think correlation implied causation, then I took a statistics class, now I don't. Sounds like the class helped. Well, maybe. So <laughs> this is sort of why, in some ways, this is an attempt to explain, in obviously a lighthearted way, why so much of what we read and what, quite frankly, uh, uh, my colleagues produce as journalism can cause people to sort of whipsaw. They almost have a whiplash every time they read a story. This week something's good for you, the next week something's bad for you, and the third week no one's quite sure. And the real answer is generally actually that no one's quite sure, although we certainly build uh, cases and build evidence and things like that. But in fact, confusing causation and correlation is a frequent, it's a frequent thing we all do actually, but uh, when you're in the news media and you have not necessarily been trained in the scientific method, it can obviously uh, really have an effect. I want to just tell you a little bit about who's actually covering health. I think that's important <clears throat> because it helps you to understand and, and in some ways probably helps you in, in terms of your discussions with people who are writing about your work or maybe who you're pitching to. Uh, who, who are these people? This was a study done, a survey done in 2008. Um, I'm, I'm on the board of journalists, um, on, as, as was mentioned, of the Association of Healthcare Journalists, excuse me, on the board of directors of the Healthcare Association of Healthcare Journalists. Um, and this was done in conjunction with a group up at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, Vish Vishnamath. But he surveyed about 500 of our members and, you know, looked at who exactly is covering health. Um, so about 70% had at least a bachelor's degree. Uh, but I won't read the slide to you, but essentially it, all the way to the bottom is, I think, maybe the most important, which is that only 8% were what we would call life sciences majors. And that was actually defined quite broadly. I mean, that, that could be anything. Um, that you would not necessarily have a lot of science classes in, but were sort of life sciences. Uh, Three percent of us are MDs, since I'm one of them. 
uh, there were sort of another 14 or so. Um, not a lot of people doing that. Obviously, on television, that, that can be a little bit different. But, you know, you have to sort of look at how many of these folks are going to, again, be very comfortable or steeped in the difference between causation and correlation, the sort of scientific method and what you can do, what you can say about various studies, anything having to do with study design, uh, understanding where science has been, where it might be going, and how the study they're covering actually fits in contextually. And I think that that's important. I, I, I will say that I don't think you need to be a life sciences major, certainly not a, a doctor, an MD or a nurse or a PA to do health journalism effectively. I, I think that most of the great health journalism is actually done by people who don't have those kinds of degrees. But you do need to somehow bridge that gap between having that core understanding of it being sort of what you've learned, whether it's in school or what have you, and getting to where you are. And that's, again, where the AHCJ, the Association of Healthcare Journalists, can fit in, as well as some of the other things that I'm involved in, I'd like to think. Um, a little bit about Reuters Health, since they are, they do pay my salary and, uh, and, and that's my day job, just to give you a sense of what we do. Uh, again, um, as a window partly into how journalists choose what to cover and what have you, but also because we do have a pretty big footprint. Um, uh, we are actually the largest uh, health news uh, agency, if you will, the largest health news provider uh, in the world. Um, there are lots of others. And, I don't mean to give them short shrift, but since I'm the one standing here, I'm going to say that we're the best. Uh, but we are the largest. That's actually uh, without, without question just by the number of syndication partners we have. Uh, we have three wires. Um, one is a medical news wire for professionals, for doctors. Uh, another is Eline, which is our consumer health wire. That's probably the one that most of you have seen. Although if you look at some of the, if you're a, in sort of a more clinical setting, you might have seen some of our professional news through our partners like hospitals, et cetera, and companies. Uh, and also an industry briefing, which is smaller, but is looking at a lot of what is core to Reuters, market moving, et cetera, business news about particular companies. So how do we actually choose studies? Well, I think, and how do we choose studies to cover? We're covering about 100 studies a week, um, most of which are for our professional wire, for our doctor audience, but a number of which, about a third of those, are for our consumer audience. So how do I actually choose studies to cover? And because we're a small group, I end up making most of those choices. Well, we are at Thomson Reuters, so using Impact Factor, and I am not here to either, uh, you know, tell you that Impact Factor is perfect or to, or to criticize it. I'm just here to say that it is a tool that we use, and within a given specialty, it, is, it can be quite helpful in terms of determining what studies tend to be, what journals tend to be more useful and, and tend to be more read by people, but it's only one factor. Um, the likelihood of changing behavior in clinical practice. That is a difficult thing to predict. Um, I don't claim to be uh, all that good at it, but I seem to be a little bit better than average. Um, the strength of evidence. How good is this study? Um, it's okay if it's an observational study, but was it done carefully? Was it done in a way that actually, you know, took into account what you would think are the obvious confounding factors? Um, and then novelty. We are a news organization. There's a reason why it is you know, a news agency, and so obviously we want things that are somewhat new. That isn't to say that we don't cover studies that are basically confirming what we've heard before. That's actually quite important, as we all know. Certainly the FDA will not uh, approve a drug based on a, a single randomized controlled clinical trial, so it might be very important to, to report on the second or third or even twelfth, depending on what kind of evidence you're talking about and how big the disease is. Um, how do we actually cover stories? Um, what are the decisions we make as we're reporting and writing about particular studies? Um, again, I won't go through the details here, but I would urge you to uh, familiarize yourselves, if you are not already, with something called healthnewsreview.org. Uh, Health News Review is run by, uh, he's quite a good friend of mine, um, a former colleague from the HCJ board, Gary Schweitzer. He's in uh, Minneapolis. And Gary, uh, as well as sort of um, uh, colleagues around the world who've done similar sites for uh, Germany, for Australia, for Canada, uh, I'm leaving off a few, um, have come up with what I think are very rigorous criteria for studies, for covering studies. Um, and he has 10. Uh, he and his colleagues have 10. And he has a whole team of, of uh, reviewers, uh, some of whom are journalists, but most of whom are uh, public health officials, uh, clinical experts in various areas, et cetera. Um, I'm pretty sure he has one in nutrition. If, if he doesn't, he probably should, but I'm pretty sure he does, uh, who look at, you know, how the stories were, were covered. And so they give us ratings based on this. So if you've got 
Seven out of 10 of these, you get a four stars because that rounds up to sort of 80%. Um, if you get one or two out of them, you, you get one star, that's not so good. And so we keep an eye on it, not everyone does. But it's a good way to keep ourselves honest because I think that that's something that the reporters also should be doing and journalists should be doing <coughs> in terms of that. And so I'd urge you to take a look. But when you look at whether or not uh, other, other news agencies or news agencies in general and, and newspapers and radio and television are actually, how adequately are they covering this? This is from a, a, a sort of a review of the first 500 stories that Gary and his team reviewed. It came out in 2008. And if you look at the, uh, it's not exactly in order here, it's just an order of what their criteria are. But if you look at where they did the best, you know, news, news, news outlets were very good at establishing the true novelty. Again, getting back to the idea that we are news outlets. That 85% were satisfactory in that. But if you look at costs or even quantifying benefits and harms, really not doing very well. That's, that's far below a failing grade. Uh, and a lot of the others are sort of uh, in, give or take, in that, in that area. Um, so again, now, and Gary's actually done a couple of uh, other reviews since then of 1,500 stories. This was the only uh, peer-reviewed one so far, I think. Uh, and I think he just, he actually just did one of 3,500 reviews or something like that um, that was put out more informally by his founder. So if reporters at mainstream news outlets are doing what we might consider, uh, and if, if I'm being a bit kind here, not as good a job as we would like, um, are there other options? You know, the same way that Gary and his team encourage us to talk about alternative explanations for things, alternative treatments for of what we're seeing in studies. Well, I'd like to talk to you about some alternative options of what are happening. And now again, this is not necessarily in my own interests. I would like to be able to stand here and tell you that Reuters Health is really the only way to get any health news today. And uh, I will sign you up all outside the door and that'll be great. And my, my bosses will be very happy with me. But that's really not true. It hasn't really been true for a long time. And I think it's less and less true. And, and the way that we have to differentiate ourselves is by providing value, which we are very proud of what we do. But who are today's media really? Who are we talking about when we say where people are getting their science and health news? Um, WCG is a uh, PR firm that some of you may be familiar with, a pretty large PR firm. Um, Brian Reed is one of, uh, is a staffer there. He's a very smart guy. He used to be at um, this news agency, allegedly, it's allegedly a news agency called Bloomberg. I, I don't actually, I've never heard of it. Um, <laughs> But uh, apparently they, they've done some things or something. Um, um, so uh, Brian used to be there, uh, and then he, he went off to, uh, to do PR. Um, I actually uh, like it when I'm dealing with I happen to know Brian personally, but I happen, I happen to like it when I uh, am dealing with uh, PR folks. Uh, with all due respect to those who haven't sort of worked as journalists, I think it often works better. Um, it's not to say that I have, don't have great relationships with a lot of PR folks who have not been journalists, but it does, it does tend to work better, again, on average. Um, but Brian does a, a great job, and he did this here, where he looked at the science, some science blogging networks. And it's actually pretty impressive. Um, this is actually a map of science blog networks that he did last year. Um, you, you don't worry about any of the uh, particular names or anything. It, it's fun the way he, he actually sort of character, he, he depicted them as they call themselves. So there's, there's a shark down there. I don't know if you can see that. And the, the shark is, of course, right next to a sailboat. Um, that's probably not a good uh, situation, but um, these are networks like, uh, and these, have, these change by the month, so this is, you know, out of date almost by design at this point. But these are uh, who have actually, uh, you know, gotten together and sort of combined forces and they cover different aspects of science. Uh, things like National Geographic now has a, a very robust uh, science blogging network. Uh, this, they, they took a lot of people from Discover Magazine, which used to have a very robust and probably will again have a very robust science blogging network. Uh, Seed Magazine, which sort of, uh, sort of struggles along uh, year after year, but they really, the, the, to, be, to give them credit, they really created the first network. And a lot of the bloggers that you see nowadays doing quite well actually are sort of diaspora of the Seed Network. Um, but this is, and I'm, I'm in there, um, there's, a, there's a sort of above the sailboat, above that sort of collection of books, it looks like uh, there are two. Um, those are my two blogs because we're not in a network, so we just kind of hang out in the middle of the ocean, I guess, and, and try and avoid the sharks. Um, going back to, you know, the, the sort of vanishing monopoly and, and this idea that uh, what we think of as journalists and, and, and of news outlets are really changing. And, 
and shrinking in many ways. So this is from the Columbia Journalism Review, actually just this month, uh, came out with, uh, they have a sort of news and numbers section at the front. And these are just a couple bullet points from them. Um, a lot of you will, of course, you know of the Science Times, you know of a lot of other, a number of other newspapers that have science sections. And, and some of you may recall, uh, as I vaguely do from my childhood, uh, Abe Rosenthal created uh, the, the Science Times in the mid-70s, um, and really because he thought it was a good advertising opportunity. And I think that's important to remember. A lot of people romanticize why the New York Times does a lot of things or why any of us do a lot of things. In fact, he thought it would be a good opportunity, and it was for many years and still is, although it's shrinking. So by the time 1989 rolled around, there were 95 weekly science sections. That's, that's a reasonable number. Um, in 2005, Christine Russell did a, a survey, and she looked around. There were 34. Uh, last year, at the, by the end of last year, there were 19. Um, that's a pretty, pretty dramatic drop, and there's no, I'm not, I have no idea what the right number is or what a good number is, but that's clearly showing you now, it's not to say that a lot of these science journalists have not gone to other sections of the paper, or maybe they're doing different things that are still in science, and in fact, sometimes this means that their work is even more prominent because it's on the front page or in the business section where different people read it than would have in the Science Times, but I think it's still important to take a look at what, we're, you know, what, what numbers we're seeing there. Again, back to that. So, <coughs> excuse me, with all of that going on, uh, with this sort of what I think is a pretty important shift from a very traditional model of bullhorn, uh, loudspeaker, to lots and lots of flowers blooming, thousands of thousand flowers blooming and lots of different things happening. How do you actually get reporters' attention? Well, this, uh, this happened to be a slide that I just sort of keep shifting around. Uh, it's from 2011, but it's very much true today. Um, this is what my inbox looks like. Um, if you are emailing me, and I don't know who you are, uh, we haven't met, we have no particular relationship. The only way you can think of to get my attention is to send me an email to my Thomson Reuters email, which is pretty easy to find. Um, you're going you're gonna to end up in this inbox, which uh, IT keeps yelling at me to clean and do all sorts of things with, and I just have given up. It's impossible. There's so much unsolicited, so many unsolicited press releases and other things. And some of them probably could be on target. Uh, some of them are absolutely ridiculous. Um, I still get, you know, I have nothing against country music, but um, we don't cover it at Reuters Health. I'm, I'm actually quite sure <laughs> we've, we've, we've never actually done a story about country music at Reuters Health. I mean, not even country music linked to longer life and people with heart disease. And I, I, I made that up, by the way. I know they're taping this. But we haven't even done that, and yet every morning I get something about, and, and you know, Dolly Parton's great, but I, I just I don't really understand why I'm getting that. And I can't get off the list. I, I've tried. It, it's really annoying. Um, so that's, that's kind of not a good way. It's just not a good way to do this. And I'm going to shift now into thinking about, you know, I've talked about the networks. I've talked about who's actually covering all these things, who you might want to get in front of, who you might want to get your research or your policy or, or any act, anything you're doing in front of. Uh, and, and I hope that this will give you some ideas on how to do that. Um, you know, it's sort of, uh, it's one of those, a lot of this, what I think is quite obvious here, um, I wish, and it may look quite obvious on the slide and as I discuss it, but I can assure you that most of what I'm saying here is not actually what a lot of sources are doing. Because if they were, they would be doing much better. I'd be, quite frankly, much happier in my, we'd probably have better stories as a result of that. Um, you know, that first thing, just, you know, trying to develop relationships. Th this is, this is actually in many ways gotten lost in today's media environment. I think in, envir in today's environment in many ways. We're all looking for that quick hit, you know, and all of that. Now, I'm, I'm as big a fan of, of Twitter and um, all kinds of social media as anyone else. I've, I've figured out, <clears throat> I, I, I've learned apparently effectively how to, you know, make things bite size and get the word out and make people click and all that. But what's most valuable about all of that, all of the, all that social media is the fact that I've been able to develop great relationships with people I never would have met before. Because what they've done is they've been able to, and I'll get to the, how to use Twitter and social media in a bit, but they've actually paid attention to what I care about. They're not sending me every country music, uh, and not to pick on them because there's lots of other offenders, they're not sending me every country music press release. They pay attention to what I care about, and when they send me something, it's got a really high uh, you know, signal to noise ratio, okay? which is what my inbox has given up on at this point. Um, keep that in mind. That's developing relationships. It's not just, can you cover this story? And I know it takes time. Uh, it takes time on both sides. But that's really, really important. So, 
answer calls. Again, it should be pretty obvious, but if a reporter calls you, even if on a very tight deadline, uh, at least answer the call and say, I can't respond or it's too short. I mean, at Reuters, we're a news, we're a wire. Uh, a lot of the time, we end up saying, could not respond by deadline. That doesn't actually mean that you didn't want to respond. That they're, they're, when we say, decline to comment, that means you didn't want to respond. When we say, could not respond by the 20-minute deadline we gave you, that's, that's pretty reasonable. I've gotten calls from reporters with 20-minute deadlines, and I'm like, sorry, put it in there that I couldn't respond. That's fine. Um, but do respond in some way, or at least respond even the next day and say, hey, you know, I couldn't do that, but love to talk to you next time. Um, don't hype. You know? We all have a tendency to, uh, especially depending on you know, sort of whether our livelihood depends on it, of making things sound better than they actually are. Um, you will get away with that. Let me, let me be perfectly blunt. You will get away with that with, with certain reporters, and you will get away with it probably with a lot of reporters at the beginning of their career. But you, the very first time that reporter realizes that you have totally, totally pulled the wool over his or her eyes is the last good story you'll get from that person. And you don't have to take my word for it. Just try it. I wouldn't encourage you, actually. But trust me that the relationships I have with people, they may not have even liked the stories I did about them for the first couple of years. Um, but they respected it and they knew there was nothing wrong with them. I was, not, I was getting everything right. And at this point, when they call me with something, boy, do I answer the phone. And let me tell you, I don't answer the phone um, unless you know, my wife's number comes up at this point. Um, don't call only when you have a paper published. In other words, don't call when you only have good news about yourself. It's fine to do that. But that shouldn't be the only conversation you're having with reporters or with bloggers. Because you want, what you want actually is, again, to develop a relationship and be useful to me or to whomever you're trying to, to, to have a relationship with. It's not just look at what great stuff I'm doing. So, you know, there's another group out there that's doing good work. And you can admit that, by the way, okay? You can admit that you're not the only team in the world that studies, you know, the properties of X, of X nutrient uh, and is doing good work. Because chances are you've cited that other team's work. Now, you may also want to say, hey, there's this paper coming out. I think it's going to get a lot of sort of, you know, a lot of attention because of what it says or what people think it says. Um, here are some issues with it, and I'd be happy to talk to you about those. That's, you know, that, and I don't mean sending an email that says, you know, this paper's coming out in PNAS, and boy, is it crap. I mean, hey, there's some legitimate scientific issues here that I think are going to get overlooked by a lot of the media. Would you like to have the smarter story? Most journalists actually do want to do that. There are a lot of pressures working against that, because we all have to hit deadlines and all those sorts of things. But let me tell you, when my staff gets rated as having the better story than our competitors on Health News Review because of, they've developed sources like that, I'm the happiest guy in the world. I really am. Um, be a reporter's back pocket expert. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, you're all experts in something. You're probably experts in many, many things. You may only be expert from your point of view in terms of reading certain kinds of studies. It's, that's probably underselling the point. But be someone who, when a reporter has a question about a study, you pick up the phone and, and talk to them whether or not they're going to quote you. Okay? This is something else important. Uh, a lot of people, oh, I spent an hour on the phone with that guy from the Times and he used one sentence. You did better than 98% of the people he spoke to that day. Okay? And you can check that out for me if, if you'd like, but that's true. Um, and you probably did even better than a lot of people who are glad they weren't quoted, but that's, that's another story. Um, help your news offices, whether you're at a university, uh, think tank, uh, somewhere in industry, at a company, help them write better press releases. Okay? And again, with all due respect to anyone in the audience who works uh, as a PIO or as someone in PR, um, a lot of those press releases, they read as if the scientist in question never saw it. And in fact, the scientist in question, if he or she did ever see it, would be horrified. You know? And there is this thing called journalism. Anyone know what journalism? Anyone heard that term? Okay, it doesn't have to do with butter, although that's sort of where the metaphor comes from. Is the right audience to make a butter joke? I don't know. But, um, so it's, it's turned from journalism with a J to journalism, where we all just churn out the same crap. Butter's not crap. But we churn out crap. Okay? And so we end up just, you look at, if you took the press release and then took the story, you would do, you could run it through a plagiarism database. It would look like we just picked it up and copied it. We don't do that. Okay? But you see an awful lot of stuff. If you Google journalism, you'll see exactly what I mean. So press releases matter. You've got to actually pay attention to that. Um, 
Pitch less, tip more. What do I mean by this? I've sort of tipped to this, actually. Um, Don't Get Caught is a, a great uh, blog run by uh, a friend of mine, someone I've become friendly with professionally, uh, Denise Graveline. She's in Washington. Um, tremendously smart. She used to work at EPA. Uh, she worked at uh, AAAS for a while, American Chemical Society. Knows the way around uh, science and, and around policy and is tremendously smart on developing relationships with reporters, telling, you know, helping people to do that. Um, what she says is, you know, pitch less, tip more. In other words, stop only sending out your stuff and saying, here's a story, here's a pitch. Go out and send something somebody else is doing. Um, use social media. There's something called Muckrack, which is sort of a, an aggregation of, of Twitter feeds by reporters and journalists. Um, a dirty little secret is that a lot of us actually look on there to see how we're ranked with other reporters. I mean, turn the camera off, I don't want to admit that. Um, but no, in all seriousness, you know, that's something that you can use it for. But more to the point, you can look at who's covering nutrition, who's covering science, who's covering health. Uh, it seems to be a worthwhile way to do that. It actually tells you what science, what science journalists are writing about. Uh, Reuters has its own version of that called Social Pulse. Uh, again, <clears throat> in the interest of promoting my own sponsor, um, there you have it with, uh, with Reuters and we're all on there. Um, again, I, I just want to reiterate, there are great ways to use Twitter. Um, use it to figure out what reporters are actually interested in rather than sending the same thing to 30 people. Um, the people who do that, who still insist on doing that, it kind of cracks me up because I can just click on what they've just sent me and see exactly who else they've sent it to. Um, that's the, one of the great things about Twitter. And I'm just, I'm not as interested if, if, first of all, it's almost always something I don't care about. But I'm just not as interested if every other of my, every one of my competitors has exactly the same story, right? This is something that I think people have uh, a little bit of trouble with. Um, I remember when I was the first uh, starting out, uh, the, 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 the MD after my name helped me get a lot of interviews. It helped me get a lot of people to talk to me because they figured, oh, I actually understood what, what I was writing about which actually wasn't the case nearly as often as they thought um, uh, because journalist medical education is, is, is pretty general. Um, but it also left me at the beginning with these, these I, and I would be so nervous about asking what I thought was a dumb question. I would have these pages and pages of notes and I'd really think I got it and I would look down there and I had no quotes I could use. They all had 18 syllables, and, you know, 18 syllable words in them. And I vaguely knew what they meant, but I knew my editors were not going to put up with it and were not going to tell me, uh, you know, that, that they were going to kill the story. So talk to me like I'm your 14 year old nephew and that could be niece too. But anyone, I mean, I, I picked 14 year old actually for a reason. Anyone want to guess what the um, reading level of the vaunted New York Times is? Who, who says uh, college? 12th grade? Ninth grade? Yeah. And those of you with the right answer, because you're all just waiting, sixth grade. Okay. Now, the science section might be a couple, a little bit older than that, to be, to be fair, but you're not talking about college. You're not talking about somebody with a PhD. You're talking about somebody with what, oh, we, I can understand the New York Times. Good for you. You passed your sixth grade reading test. Okay? <laughs> and that's not to criticize the New York Times. I suspect if you did the same analysis on Reuters, it's probably even lower, to be honest. But I just, I want you to understand that. Um, start your own blog, you know? Um, <clears throat> Kevin MD, very successful. He's an internist, a family practice doc up in uh, New Hampshire. And he has started almost an empire for himself. He has all kinds of guest bloggers and all kinds of this whole network of people who contribute to what he's doing. Uh, has lots of uh, advertising and all sorts of things. He's actually turned into a business for himself. But more to the point, that's where doctors go when they want to express an opinion. They know he has a pretty big megaphone that people are going to respond to it. They're going to see it. They're going to comment on it. Um, skeptical Scalpel, another one of my favorites. Um, this is a guy who, that's actually him all the way on the left uh, a number of years ago though. He's just retired from active surgery, but he's got this blog, it's really smart. He is very, quite skeptical. Sometimes even more skeptical than I am, which is, which is great to read. Um, but you know, how to operate on the wrong site. Obviously this is not actually a manual, but it is a sort of, he read a bunch of case reports and said, how the hell are people doing this in, in 2000? 12, I guess it was, when he wrote that. Um, I've started my own blog, a little bit of a plug, you'll, you'll forgive me, um, called Retraction Watch. Uh, I co-founded it, I should say, it's not my own blog, um, with a guy named Adam Marcus, who runs a, a magazine called uh, Anesthesiology News. Um, we cover scientific retractions, um, obviously not 
sort of uh, the good news that most scientists want to talk about all the time. But we've really, much to our surprise, uh, tapped into a massive community of people who are constantly helping us and constantly uh, reading us. We, uh, we're, we're going you know, above, we have about 100,000 unique visitors a month now, which is uh, for a couple of guys with a WordPress blog. We're pretty happy with that. Um, and we, we, get, we get quoted all the time. And this is, this is one of those things that I would just sort of put in, your, you know, put in the back of your mind. That, that blogger that asks you to comment on something, you say, oh, it's a blogger. I'm not going to return the call. Um, that blogger may very well end up being quoted by the mainstream media because they have so few reporters. Um, Adam and I, not a week goes by when we're not uh, interviewed and quoted by, whether it's NPR, whether it's New York Times, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, internationally, in fact, too. We're, we're apparently huge in Korea. We're waiting to, to get over there because there was a whole, whole spread about us and we wrote a story there about them, I should say. Um, it's, it's, uh, so pay attention to that. Um, and this also speaks to the notion that a lot of bloggers are keeping scientists honest. I, I hate to stand here and talk to you that that's a requirement, but it, it damn well is. And keeping scientists honest in our particular sort of way of thinking about keeping journals honest, keeping publishers honest, that's something that journalists are doing. Again, just another example of a, a great, uh, a great uh, blog that, that was launched a number of years ago, uh, White Coat Underground. Um, uh, Pal MD is a, a, an internist in uh, southern Michigan. And another one, I could go on like this forever, but uh, Elaine Shatner is a, an oncologist by training uh, who then went back to, to journalism school, still practices a bit of oncology, of, of cancer uh, medicine, uh, but she has a great blog and, and writes from her own experience as well. She actually uh, herself had breast cancer at one point, and so she, that informs a lot of what she's doing. And that's one of the nice things you can do in a blog. You can let people know exactly who you are. You're not just a sort of black and white byline. Um, would love to get, to get you to know us at AACJ. Um, we are uh, about 1,300 members now, about 1,400, in fact, uh, from the latest numbers around the country, around the world. We have an active international membership, although mostly here in the U.S. Um, this is our website. It's healthjournalism.org. Um, just a couple of sort of bullet points here. We do have an annual conference. It's quite well attended, uh, much like yours. Um, our con annual conference is in March in, in Boston. Um, there are opportunities for all sorts of things, including a conference exhibition. But uh, you may want to check us out and, and get a look at what we're doing because, again, we're, we're only journalists uh, can, can be members. Um, so finally, I just want to sort of ask you a sort of plea with you, plead with you, I should say, to uh, help me and my colleagues and everyone, all of us, to avoid this. Um, this is a great site, uh, great in that sort of cringing, can't take your eyes away from a car accident kind of way, um, where this is actually a site that was put up in the UK. Um, this is a screenshot, so it's gotten even more robust since then, but it's called Killer Cure. And what it is, is it's the Daily Mail. Those of you who know the Daily Mail know that they don't somehow, you know, and again, this is being a little bit mild, they seem to have missed that sort of uh, the class on the distinction between causation and correlation, <clears throat> or the hundreds of classes since then, it seems to be. Um, and so everything in their mind, when they write study story after study story, causes or cures cancer, uh, causes or prevents cancer. It's quite, quite remarkable. In fact, some things do both. Uh, alcohol, that's sort of, you know, I know that's not a core thing here, but obviously sort of a nutrition issue. Um, air pollution, and this is just A, and as the Brits say, this goes A to Z, and it's, it's quite extensive. Um, and you can actually, you can actually um, click on there and, and correct the story. You can't correct the actual story, but you can sort of add to this database of what's wrong with it. Uh, and somebody somewhere hopefully might read that, uh, but they are certainly gathering it. So let's work to avoid this. Let's, you know, work together to actually kind of help our, what I think is a sort of core goal for both uh, journalists and those working uh, in the field to actually have an informed public that understands what's going on, that isn't sort of whipsawed, whiplashed from, from week to week about different studies and things. That's, that's my goal. I, I know it's yours, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to tell you, to tell you my point of view on that. Um, that's just my contact info and acknowledgments. Um, again, that's me on Twitter. It's become probably the best way to reach me. Um, I, I sort of see it most instantly. That may change, but right now it is. Uh, that's the blog Retraction Watch, um, and I always thank uh, Nancy, who's my deputy. Um, in addition to being my deputy at Reuters, she helps me with slides and keeps everything running while I'm off doing fun things like this. So thanks very much, and I look forward to your questions.